And now I'd like to introduce you to our speaker that it sounds like you all been, have, have been getting familiar, uh, Dr. Dion or D. Uh, Rosader. Uh, Dr. Rosader is a science communication engagement and outreach expert who has previously worked with nonprofits, universities, government offices, and for-profit businesses to improve their science engagement efforts. This includes creating new and or improving existing science communication, marketing, education, diversity, and outreach initiatives. Dee is currently the executive director for Science at Cal, and it's a program that shares the excitement and relevance of UC Berkeley research with public audiences. Through lectures, street fairs, festivals, and more. Uh, okay, so she also works with scientists across campus to build sustainable and impactful science outreach collaborations with community and campus partners. Dee's previous positions include the Director of Mass Media Fellowship of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and Scientific Programs and Outreach Manager at the Carnegie Institute for Science. Dee received her bachelor's degree from UC Berkeley and her PhD from UC Santa Cruz, both in Earth and Planetary Sciences. So on behalf of NNLM and our audience, welcome and thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Tiffany, for that wonderful introduction. I am on another thing that I, an apology I'm going to make now as it relates to being home is that because of that, I don't have my two screen system. So it's a little bit harder for me to navigate chats and things like that. So bear with me um, because my presentation, you know, takes up the whole screen. Uh, but it's so great to be here again for the third time. This is the end of my trifecta of programming I'm going to be doing for you. Um, it's been such a delight to hang out with you all. I assume we have some returning faces, but also some new folks. Um, so thank you for being here. Uh, I'm going to give you just a little bit because I know a lot of you have seen at least one or both of my previous talks, but I will give you a little bit about who I am because I feel like it's very meaningful to this story as it relates to systemic racism and science communication, because I really, uh, my history and my experiences led me to this presentation and starting to really think about the, the structure of, of racism and power and how it relates to science communication specifically. I'm going to start with a land acknowledgement. Typically, what I would do is I would let, ask for the land acknowledgement of the area in which most people are tuning in from, but we're always all, all over the place. So I'm going to start with just the Berkeley, the UC Berkeley land acknowledgement. And I do that because if I'm going to talk about racism, um, I think this is the most perfect place to begin thinking about how we contribute to racism and systemic racism within our organizations um, by initial stealing of the land from indigenous communities. So I want to just take a moment to recognize that Berkeley sits on the Huchun territory, the ancestral and unceded land of the Ohlone people, the successors of the historic sovereign and sovereign Verona band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona Band. Every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. By offering this land acknowledgement, the Berkeley community not only recognizes the history of the land on which we stand, but also recognizes that the Ohlone people are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and broader Bay Area communities today. Thank you for allowing me the time to make that not land acknowledgement. I hope for just, I'll give you just a few moments to recognize your own land in which you are on and which you stand. Thank you for taking the time to do that. Um, I also like to start this talk off with just a quick definition of racism so that we're all grounded in the same space. Racism involves one group having the power to carry out systematic discrimination through the institutional policies and practices of the society and by shaping the cultural beliefs and values that support those racist policies and practices. Racism includes race prejudice and social and institutional power. 
Racism includes a system of advantage based on race, and racism includes a system of oppression based on race. Racism is a white supremacy system. Uh, this is the definition at racialequitytools.org. I'll also quickly just define science communication, just once again, so we're all on the same page. This is a practice of transmitting science-related information from one person to another, typically from a scientist, a science educator, or a science communicator to another. This can be from peer-reviewed articles to tweets, um, and if you've been joining me, throughout the last few sessions, you've heard a lot about science communication. Um, today I'll talk about really the problem. Um, that's going to be the majority of what I'll talk to you today about. Then we'll go into some uh, the motivation between why black, indigenous, and people of color should participate. Why would we create deliberately create spaces for them to do so? What are the incentives to do so? And then we'll have some tips on how to incorporate science communication and specifically inclusive science communication practices into science. Um, I will. I do actually have a list of resources that I'll hand that I'll make publicly available that includes all of the resources that I provide for you today. I found that that's especially helpful helpful for this talk. So I'll um, add those. Uh, maybe Tiffany, when the video gets posted on YouTube, it can have a link to that public document. Sure. Uh huh. So again, I'll give a tiny little brief intro as I normally do. Um, I was an undergrad at Berkeley. I started in physics. It was a very exclusive uh, space. I was one of only two women in my year, and I was the only person of color. So really what saved me in that, in that space where I learned to sort of have a footing and have a real recognition and identity in science was through the Society for the Advancement of Chicanos, Hispanics, and Native Americans in Science uh, conference and organization. If you've never heard of SACNAS, please look them up. I always add them because I'm still flabbergasted when I hear folks who haven't heard of SACNAS, and this really saved me. Um, I would not be a scientist as if, if it wasn't for SACNAS. Uh, they provided so many opportunities for me to join summer research programs so through their programs. Uh, I started doing research in atmospheric physics, so applying physics to the atmosphere, and I fell in love with atmospheric science, and I became an atmospheric science major. I switched majors, um, and uh, I always talk about this bush Carey moment when this was the moment when Care, uh, Bush won the re-election in 2004. This is the first time that I participated in election, and I was at UC Berkeley. It was very, it was a sad moment in time, but it was a moment when um, I had one of my professors really, really uh, take that time to reflect on what it means to be a scientist and our privilege and what our responsibility is to communicate science and to engage with the public because exit polls showed that the population, the general public, people outside of an academic sphere weren't thinking about the environment or, uh, you know, public health in the way, same ways that scientists were. So we were getting it. it we're always frustrated and annoyed and, and feeling like there's this disconnect between what the scientists believe to be true and what we have power and control over and what the public may view as more important. So there's that disconnect there. And of course, misinformation and disinformation and literacy rates and these sorts of things. And she really was the first person to tell me that this is the responsibility of the scientists, that we have been, we've done a bad job communicating science and we need to leave the ivory tower. So that's uh, to do that work. So that is this kind of moment in time. I started thinking more and more about DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion in science communication in graduate school. Um, so I went to UC Santa Cruz after UC Berkeley. I started working for the graduate diverse, uh, division on their diversity efforts. And this is the first time I started thinking about institutional and systemic racism. And again, diversity, equity, inclusion efforts at a university level. So at an institution level, um, at a systemic level, at a level in which it wasn't just the day-to-day -day or how it affected me and my major um, or in my lab settings, but also how it affected the university. I became a mass media science and engineering fellow through the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And the purpose of this program is to create more accurate science news and better science communication among scientists. And this also serves as an alternative career path 
And students, uh, now it's postdocs and graduate students and undergrads, can be placed in news outlets nationwide, such as the LA Times. I'm sorry if you see this, like, little blue. Let me get out of there. Can I turn that off? Yes. Okay, there we go. Um, that was annoying me. So if you guys could see it, sorry if it was annoying you. <laughs> It was grammarly. Um, so students and postdocs are placed in news outlets nationwide, like the LA Times, Chicago Tribune, Philadelphia Inquirer, Scientific America, you see the list there, and it's supported by a consortium of funders. Um, one of the things that bothered me while I was in the fellowship program and that I stated outright at the end when I was asked how I felt about my experience and how I felt about um, my science communication summer. Um, one of the things that bothered me was that I felt as though we were writing and creating news for a certain demographic, right? If you look at who we were, uh, where we were placed, the LA Times, all these wonderful places, um, it felt as though we might be targeting just a small sliver of the population. Again, I'm starting to think about um, you know, how certain folks are marginalized in both STEM and now thinking about how the fellowship plays a role in that marginalization through including all news outlets that were, again, in my mind, maybe a bit uh, high level or still academic, even though they're made for public audiences. So I'm going to share with you now, um, because I had this sneaking suspicion that this was the case, that we were only reaching a, a segment of the population. And I'm just going to share now some U.S. English liter literacy rates. And uh, I do that because those new date agencies back then, this was um, over 10, 11, 12 years ago, uh, were mostly almost entirely uh, uh, communicating news in English. And that's definitely what all the fellows were doing. And so I wanted to think about, well, again, are we reaching only a certain segment of the population? So you can see here that 14% of adults are illiterate, 21% uh, of adults read at a fifth grader lower level, and 50% of adults read at an eighth grader lower level. Uh, I do mark here, is this the best measure to think about these things? And I say that because there are lots of other, there. I think just literacy rates in and of itself is a bit of a racist measure. Um, if we think about how the education levels, or again, these things are all going to be determined on values outside of our control, which I'll get to in just a moment. Um, and so it's something to think about, but it is as it relates to my experience in the Mass Media Fellowship Program, it's definitely something I should be looking at or they should be looking at at this time. 15% of adults can read at a university or undergraduate level. And I would say all of those news outlets that I showed you previously are going to be at a university undergraduate level. There's still words, right? When we are reading newspapers or reading news articles um, on the web where there are words that I don't know and that I have to look up even though I have a PhD. Right, so these are, this is a space that is very exclusive to uh, folks who can read at this level. In addition, um, as we all know, um, if you've been sort of thinking about the ways that we even communicate over mass media, uh, we've been really skewing towards more online uh, versus print news outlets. So news watchers prefer to, to uh, watch their television, um, to use the television to get their news, not the web. These numbers are decreasing. Um, so this is as, as it relates to listening or even reading. So again, writing news for a newspaper is now almost obsolete. We still have newspapers, of course, but more and more and more and more of these news outlets are looking towards the web. And again, this was 12 years ago. Things have shifted rapidly. Um, but a lot of these folks were still writing for, uh, a lot of the fellows when I had the fellowship were still writing for print publications. All right. Roughly half of Americans get their news on digital platforms. And uh, so that means digital platforms, meaning obviously their computers or their telephones, and as opposed to television. And again, these numbers are changing. News uh, websites most prefer, are the most preferred way to get their digital news. So this is 
even if we're getting our digital news, we're getting them through websites um, and then search and social media and podcasts. So again, we're using this, these websites to do that. Okay, so that's how we are getting our news. Now, if we just think about literacy by race, because this is a race systemic racism in science communication talk, I always like to show these numbers as it relates to um, proficiency in, in reading as it relates to race. We could show this um, for economic status. We could show this for city and county and state. Um, but for race, you can see here that if we look at kind of just proficiency uh, in as it relates to diff different races, you can see that 14% of the white population is proficient versus 2 and 4% for black and Hispanic. This is an old uh, plot. I've looked for new uh, plots for this and, you know, the data exists. It's not that much different, but uh, but I like how this plot organizes the data in this way. I should be making my own plot so that these are more updated, but I want to let you know this is a bit outdated, which is why I say that because it says Hispanic and not Latino, and it groups everyone else as to other, which is problematic in so many different ways. Um, so these numbers have been updated, but the point is, is that proficiency differs across races, and also um, you can see here that below basic in the green increases between white, black, and Hispanic populations as well. So let's look about diversity, because we thought about literacy, we thought about communication, we thought about race as it relates to literacy. Now let's think about uh, diversity in the newsroom. Only 12 to 13% of newsroom staff are members of ethnic minority groups, 10% of newsroom supervisor of ethnic minority groups, and 38% of newsroom staff are women. That means that news is getting filtered through a white male lens. I hope this is not news to you, but if it is, it's that's it. That, that's something we need to be concerned about. When you're watching news, when you're hearing news, when you're listening to news, and when you're reading news, you have to understand that that news is getting filtered through the lens of the person who's writing or communicating. And of course, we know, as this data shows, that most that means mostly white men. This is the percentage of minorities in newsrooms internships. Uh, I'll give a moment to talk about how this data has not been updated in either of these circumstances in just one minute. But you can see here that the number of percentage of, of minorities in newsrooms have been decreasing. And still, it's only about, you know, 25, 30 percent here. And you can see that the newsroom internships, uh, interns make up diverse newsrooms internships make up 20 to 30 percent of the internship groups. But you can see here that there's this disconnect between how many interns make up this population versus how many people are actually staffed. So you can see that there's a disconnect here. There's more interns uh, who are, are, are of minority groups than staff. And I always have to note this is true, right? We know that this is true in, our, in the sciences. We know that this is true in, um, you know, in academia. We know that this is true in po policy, right? Look at the intern staff for the con for Congress or for the Senate. The interns are a beautiful array of beautiful colors, and you look at the senators and Congress people are very, very clearly skewed to one demographic um, and one gender. So this disconnect exists, and I always have to know, we look at tech, right? The interns that are in Google and Facebook and, um, you know, every tech industry, every tech business has an internship program for minorities, and their minority numbers are minuscule. Um, so we know that folks aren't getting hired there. Like I said, I just wanted to note about some of these numbers being old. Uh, the AP just wrote an article about the efforts to track diversity in journalism are lagging because newsrooms either aren't tracking or they aren't being transparent. So if they are tracking their diversity, they're not sharing the, we, the diversity numbers um, with folks who are doing this research. So this is, this is an effort since that's been heavily, heavily worked on. Um, people have been really trying to get these diversity newsroom numbers ever since George Floyd's death. And it's just not, we're not getting anywhere because these newsrooms aren't handing over their demographic data. There is more effort across newsrooms to track sources. So how, who are the people that we're reaching out to when we're uh, reporting the news? So that being people of color from minority, minority or marginalized communities and also women. 
And then of course there are diversity trainings. There has been a new study by the Pew Research Center which shows that if you're younger, if you're a woman, and if you're a black indigenous or a person of color, they say, they skew more to saying there's not enough diversity in the newsroom. Shocker, right? So for example, 68% per, of 18 to 29 year olds uh, say that there's not enough diversity in newsrooms versus only 37% of folks who are older than 65 years old um, in the same newsroom. So people who are younger, women and people of color uh, view not enough diversity in the newsrooms. Again, maybe not too surprising. I share this photo because going back to my experience in the Mass Media Fellows Program, after the Mass Media Fellows Program, uh, and after I finished my PhD, I became the director of the fellowship program. And Tiffany mentioned that in my bio. And I would go to newsrooms across the country uh, to do site visits for the fellowship. And what I found is that I would enter a room like this, and this is a morning news brief, uh, and I literally would sit in a room of 20 to 50 completely monochromatic, right, D totally white folks in the room. I wouldn't see Asians, I wouldn't see Indians, let alone Black, Indigenous, um, or Latino Hispanics. They just were not existing in the newsroom. So I took something that I had the experience of in my in my one tiny little space and thought hard about how how we were reaching marginalized communities. And then when I became the director, I could see it in the newsrooms. I could see these newsrooms being um, really totally taken over by mostly uh, entirely white and uh, more male than female. So again, this was something that I witnessed and is something that the, that the statistics prove um, to be true. So, and to give you a little background on that photo, I took this photo to send to my supervisor to show her um, how white the newsrooms were specifically, not knowing that I'd be giving this presentation 10 years later. Um, so it really was something that was on my mind at that time. This is uh, numbers around science literacy. Uh, this is a number correct out of 11. You can take this test too from the research uh, the Pew Research Center. Again, I'll give you the link if you'd like to test your science knowledge. Uh, out of 11 right, uh, U.S. adults tend to get 6.7% correct. You can see here that, again, no surprise, science literacy is related to how much schooling we have. It's related to whether or not we're, we're what our gender is, and it's uh, related to our race. So these numbers change based on these three factors, but overall we get 6.7 uh, numbers correct. So one of the things that I want to take a moment to really look at is if we pull apart the college educated group and the non-college educated group and kind of zoom in on race there, you can see here that if we look at non-college educated white population is more science literate using this study than college educated black individuals. Okay, so white non-college folks do better on this test than black folks who are college educated. And this is where we take the moment to just stop and say, if you can't see the systemic problem, right? This is blaring right in front of us. Uh, this is an issue. This has nothing to do with genetics, right? We know race is a social construct. We know that a social construct sh shouldn't be determining how well we do on literacy tests or uh, science literacy tests, but here it is. You're wondering if there's a problem with a test. Of course there's a problem with a test, which is my big, Bold, red lettering at the bottom. Thank you, Leah. Let's not forget who writes the test. Who's writing the test, folks? White men. So white men are going to do better on these tests. And we know that if you have not uh, listened to Radio Lab G, please do. It's about systemic racism of test writing, just test writing <laughs> all across the board. Specifically in that case of Radio Lab G, it's the IQ test. But we know here, we know if any of y'all are professors, if any of y'all are writing tests, if any of y'all are taking tests, you, 
be aware that your tests are also uh, inherently gendered and racist and are fully engulfed in the system of oppression um, that we are talking about today. So it is something to be aware of. Um, I want you to enter into the chat. Thanks, Leah. Um, yep, that too. Yes, money, how much, and, and again, we can take all of these numbers and and divide them and organize them as it relates to uh, economic status as well um, and see how, and of course, these numbers are all going to depend on those things as well as, as it's related to race and as it's all related to, to education systems as well. So take a moment to enter into the chat. What might be some consequences of what we just learned for society, for individuals, for institutions? What are the consequences of not creating science news for everyone, uh, for having uh, a system of racism that affects our literacy, our science literacy? I'm going to give you some consequences, but I want you to think about some consequences first. Corinne, would you like to And they're all really good. Yep. Lots of issues related to health popping up. Science solutions. Distrust of sources. Yep. Developed and nurtured biases. These are all spot on. Mistrust of scientific and medical institutions on a large scale. Not being able to make decisions that affect people. Yep. Worst health outcomes. Population is manipulated. Love that one. Yep. All right, so I'm, these are all correct. You guys are right there with me. Look at this, limited access to information, inaccuracies in information, limited or no access to services, unhealthy norms, unhealthy behaviors, inability to act on opportunities even when they are available, higher disease incidence, prevalence, and mortality, and the list goes on. This slide was created pre-COVID, and look where we are now, right? We know that these two misdiagnoses, yep, a continued belief of superiority and for inferiority based on race, yep, we'll get there too. So these are all exactly right. Um, so you guys are right there with me, perfect. So we've thought about exclusion in the news, we've thought about exclusion in the sciences, we've thought about exclusion in in education, well, we haven't, but I'm telling you, you, you all probably know, exclusion in education as it relates to teachers, textbooks, Wikipedia, right? We talked briefly about exclusion in test writing. We've mentioned in the chat exclusion in test subjects, right? Whether that be in medical science, whether that be in psychology, if you haven't heard of this term, uh, weird, which is Western educated from industrialized, rich and democratic countries. Most of our psychology and sociology studies are done on folks who are weird. Most of our medical studies are done on folks who are weird, meaning, I love this, um, should all of our psych studies be done on these kids? They're all done on a specific demographic. Um, so this is something we're thinking about and talking about and should not be ignored. So exclusion, this trickles into our perception of who is allowed to be a scientist, who is allowed to be a part of science, who is allowed to even think about science, right, let alone be a scientist. How does science show up in our everyday lives? How is science meaningful for ourselves? And who is allowed to be a science communicator? This is trickles into our perceptions either within society, within our institutions, within our norms, within our interactions, within our behaviors, within our thoughts right? Everything from society at large down to the way that we communicate with each other, right? And again, this is excluding folks um, based on all of the, the, these exclusionary practices have an effect on every kind of facet of life. 
Here's a recent headline. A new study suggests people have a hard time believing black and Latino women are scientists. Flight attendant to black female doctor. We're looking for actual physicians. This is in the news. This is pop culture. This is from 30 Rock. Liz Lemon says, grizz.com. Thanks for pretending to be bouncers. These are her two staff here. Um, and grizzin.com say, maybe someday we'll live in a world where you ask us to pretend to be scientists. Malcolm X said, the media is the most powerful entity on earth. They have the power to make the innocent guilty and to make the guilty innocent, and that is power. I'm going to uh, play this video from PBS Tools for Anti-Racist anti Teaching, and I've cut out the part that was specifically on media, and this is a beautiful excerpt, mostly listening to Laura Limbaugh um, speak, and I'm going to, sh well, you guys have captioning uh, in here. I might see if I can pull up the captioning, because we're going to listen to this on 1.25 speed, just so um, we don't have it take up too much time, but I think that it's very valuable to listen to. No institution has played a bigger role um, in sustaining white supremacy and racial capitalism in this country than the media, right? Television, films, Hollywood, this is a space of culture. Culture is a space where the rules of society are taught um, and affirmed and sustained, right? This is how we understand what the terms of engagement are with each other in this social contract as, that we are part in, right? No matter how broken or how distorted that social contract might be, we are in a social contract with each other, right? You, you share a society, you share your citizens of a country, you're part of a, you know, of a community. There's a social contract. That all those terms, all those things, all those values, right? All that gets defined, normalized, um, and passed on through media and culture. And so there is this um, very insidious role that uh, the, the media has played in this country, whichever sector you take of that, whether it's journalism or Hollywood or the small screen, all of it, right? Um, and what the media has done in this country, it's, it's centered the story of the conqueror, right? It has told the story that, uh, that serves and centers the needs of whiteness, um, that justifies this, the racial capitalism that this country is founded upon, right? And so what that looks like is that the media erases um, actual history. So there are there's so many things we're never taught, we never hear of stories we don't see anywhere. Um, but then there's also the active distortion, right, of what our, our history is, so that when things are taught, they are taught deliberately in ways that are untruthful. Um, you know, and then this all serves to normalize um, this racial capitalism, so that we all then accept these rules and these norms, and we enact them, even you know when we're not thinking of it. So so there's this level of normalization that is. Um, really insidious, and, and it leads to a country that um, is unaware of its history, then cannot make, then can, because it's unaware of its history, the country cannot make connections, the needed connections between our history and our current day, right? Um, and then, you know, ultimately we have a country that is in denial about who it is. Um, you know, when the, the little bit of time that there was uh, journalism coverage about the crisis of migrant children being taken, stolen, kidnapped, put in concentration camps along the border, right? Because that's still happening, but it's out, out of our news cycle. There was a moment where it was in the news cycle. During that time, the, the kind of rallying cry for those who did actually care enough to, to pay attention and talk about it was, this is not who we are as a nation. Well, that's a lie. We did this to Native American children. We did this to enslaved African families. We have done this since the inception. We have stolen and kidnapped and held children. We've done this all along. We were founded upon this as a country. So like, wh what do you mean this is not who we are? There, there perhaps is nothing more American than racial terror, right? And so we have this media who has sustained this idea of who we are as a country that is completely um, incorrect. It's inaccurate, it's violent, and it's a fallacy. And we ultimately cannot heal that we, that, that we cannot face. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that's the, the sort of really critical part that the media plays in this now. Um, that was very good, and thank you. That is exactly who we are. She says it perfectly, as do you, Jeanette. So what does this mean for consequences and reporting? Uh, this was at a climate summit. Uh, this is an, a photo that was published by the AP, and 
the it came out that this was the original photo. A Ugandan climate activist was actually cropped out. So this is future Dr. Vanessa Nakate was cropped out of this photo. And what she said was very poignant. She said, you weren't just removing me from the climate conversation. You are removing my entire continent from the conversation. Um, and she said, I didn't want to be a part of the conversation around racism and around exclusion, but yet here we are, right? This very young, I, I think she was in junior high, maybe not even high school. Um, and this is a, a way in which that we can very, very, very deliberately, a very, very, very kind of point out these ways in which folks are being excluded in conversations in the media. Um, as we listen to Laura Limbaugh, that's just one example. There's hundreds, thousands. I want us to reread these definitions of race and racism with our lens on media. So after you heard what she said, after you've listened to what I've said, Race is a social construct. It sorts people into groups according to perceived physical and behavioral differences. It associates differential power, or value, power, and privilege to these characteristics. It establishes a social status ranking among the different groups. Racism is enacting and normalizing systematic degradation and mistreatment of people of color and bolstering the racial hierarchy that places values on whiteness and of white people above other racial, racial groups through cultural representation and messaging, institutionalized policies and practices and individual beliefs and actions. So I wanna note that oppressive systems include not just racism and white supremacy, but also patriarchy, classism, and ableism as well. If we think about consequences in COVID reporting, um, this is the fact that male experts were featured three to one in UK reporting. Um, in the BBC outlet, men were featured 11 to one. In one high profile New York Times article, eight men and zero women were featured in the article. And neither epidemiology nor medicine are exceptionally male dominated fields. So we see this again, as it relates to racism and gender. In pop culture, right, this is Maya Bialik. You might know she is a neuroscientist. She has a PhD, and she was featured in the Big Bang Theory. This is what she looks like on the red carpet. This is what she looks like when she's out and about. And this is what she looks like on the, on the television show as, a, again, a, a, another a PhD. So our perceptions of what scientists should look like, both in race, in gender, and stereotyping, even in gender, in feminism. So thinking back, I just wanted to bring up those two examples because they were a little bit different from our racism conversation, but I think very important. I know, no lab coat. <laughs> I should have pulled one with her in a lab coat. So why should black indigenous people of color participate? Why should we support these efforts? And what are the incentives to do so? Moving on. So being an effective communicator is not just about what's flowing out of our mouths, but also the attitudes of the folks looking in. We've talked this, librarians know all about stereotyping. I hear you, Carol. Um, this is a, something that I brought up in my science communication workshop and talk about the communication, how, again, it's not just about information flowing out. This is this idea of the deficit model, but instead about how people are perceiving the communicators. And one of the things you, if you were there, you might remember me talking about is that who's talking determines how people, how much people accept what they've heard. So if you trust, identify or share values with the messenger, you're more likely to accept the message. That means our beliefs are heavily connected to our community meaning you are best equipped to communicate to your friends and family, meaning black indigenous and people of color are most equipped to talk to black indigenous and people of color, right? We need to be inclusive in our messaging so that our messages are inclusive and so that 
Not only that, people are getting the information, but they're also trusting the information, right? It's not just that they're getting the information, but they're trusting the information that they're, that's being communicated. So I'm Latina, I'm a woman, I'm a first gen, I'm a scientist, I'm a science communicator. I'm best equipped to speak with folks who, sh who share my identity and my intersectionalities. You are best equipped to communicate to folks who are like you because also to be aware, I'm not saying not to communicate to or with folks who are not like you, but you need to be aware of the fact that there are miscommunication risks if people are communicating to, or to folks who are outside of their ethnicity, their culture, their language, their gender, their age, religion, geographic location, literacy, economic status, social class, disability. So folks who are falling outside of the space in which they exist have risks of miscommunicating. And I'll show you an example. This is the um, World Health Organization uh, collateral guidelines around how to protect yourself from COVID-19. This was specifically for the region of Africa. And the communication said, wash your hands regularly for, for 40 seconds with soap and running water or alcohol-based hand rub. And the communities in Africa, I was listening to a talk about communicating uh, COVID risk to African communities. And these folks who were working at NGOs on the ground were like, this is absolutely not useful for us. These guidelines are meaningless for most of the communities that we work with because where the hell are you gonna find 40 seconds of running water? So this has a direct implication for the health of the people that we're communicating with about COVID guidelines. That's one example. Um, another incentive, I'm gonna go through some incentives now. Why, why do we want to include folks? One is dismantling the hierarchy of credibility. This means that those who have high status within society define how things are. Those who have low status, may be viewed as misinformed. Some folks said that in the chat, right? You alluded to that. We want to not only dismantle the hierarchy of credibility around who gets to decide what's true and what's not true and who, who is viewed as misinformed, but also we want to dismantle systems of oppression, right? Systems of, of oppression are produced by, by and work together to maintain power and status. So not only does power and status and hierarchy exist, but oppression works to maintain power and status and hierarchy. So we want to dismantle all of this, right? Not just the hierarchy, but the system that maintains that hierarchy. This, as we know, is based on race, gender, gender ability, even our academic institutions and including our disciplines and subdisciplines, right? There's prestige associated with race, gender, ability, academic institution, and discipline. We want to disrupt that by showcasing folks from those who are outside of this hierarchy of the highest forms of society, the, those folks who have power and who determine how things are. Another incentive is simply that science is reflective of the, of the society and the culture in which it's participating. So if we only have one group participating, not only are they defining how th things are, but they're also defining how things are based on their own culture. Oops, not sure what happened there. So science is not objective. Investigators are people that live in a society that are impacted by political and cultural considerations, that carry cultural values, that live in a, in a society with social norms, and all of these things are informing science. Science is a human endeavor that includes all of our brilliance and all of our bias. This is true for science communication. Science communication is not objective, right? Science communicators are people that live in society, that are impacted by political considerations and cultural values and social norms, right? And so therefore, 
as well as dismantling the hierarchy, we want to dismantle the fact that science is from one specific society and one for specific culture. Again, that gets to define science. We are not defining science based on the society at large. We're defining science based on one specific group. So if we think about hierarchy, oppression, power, idea and the idea that science is objective, we know that when dominant cultures and values and norms in STEM or in communication or in education systems, if they mismatch with the values and norms of minority groups, then that means that STEM, formal learning environments and informal learning environments can be experienced as alienating, unwelcome, and outright hostile. The spaces in which we all live and work are alienating, unwelcome, and hostile to people who are not part of our dominant culture. And we know that, right? This is inclusion. This is belonging. This is othering in STEM, othering in these groups. We want to dismantle this so that we aren't a space that is unwelcoming and alienating and hostile. Because we know it is. I want us to all think about, and I know a lot of us in the audience um, may be from a dominant group, whether that's white or male, right, or able, able-bodied. Think about the way in which our systems and we contribute to alienating and unwelcome and hostile spaces. So another incentive, participation directly benefits you, anyone, anyone who's participating. Communication exposes you or BIPOC to the greatest number and variety of opportunities. Recognition leads to more resources and impact is proportional to participation. So the reason it says you is because I often give this talk to minority students. And so I'm always like trying to minority groups. So I'm trying to encourage minority groups to get involved in science communication. But take this information, you know, this is for other groups and how, why you might want to include minority voices. More resources, more recognition, more participation, including all those other incentives I listed. So what do we do about it? So these are some strategies for increasing diversity, inclusion, and belonging in STEM using science communication. So I just want to say that when I became the director of the Mass Media Fellows Program, I created a Spanish language branch of the fellowship. So that meant that this grew out of my desire to make the fellowship more inclusive. The goals were to diversify science news industry and to create more opportunities for diverse students and to increase coverage of science news in growing and marginalized communities. So these were Spanish speaking scientists who were placed at Spanish news outlets who were writing only science news and only in Spanish news outlets. So they were really, really bringing a lot of value to those news outlets because of this, uh, this requirement to only be talking about science, right? And um, one of the other things that I did was the, the news sites changed under my, my fellowship, uh, at the years in which I managed the fellowship. We were now at KQED, at Slate, at Wired, at National Geographic, at Discover Magazine, Nova, and PBS News Hours. So these were news outlets that weren't, um, primarily, uh, and that they did a lot, a lot of, uh, of alternative media forms. Um, Univision is a Spanish language news outlet, if that's your question, Leah. Um, it's the largest Spanish news outlet in the world. Um, there's also, so I want to let you know, I also am just using this as an opportunity to let you know that, there, that the Mass Media Fellowship exists. Um, that it has much more diversity in its news outlet sites now. It has a Spanish language branch. And then also there's a, an internship called Diverse Voices in Science Journalism that's also at Science Magazine that I managed while I was there. And it existed before and it still exists now. Um, so if you know undergrads who are interested in science communication, please pass along this opportunity. These are folks, they don't have to be uh, scientists. 
All right, here are some 12 tips. Um, this, these are tips for applying what we've learned today. I know a lot of people are like, well, what can I do and how do I help this situation? So some of these tips come from um, an inclusive SciComm uh, toolkit. Some of the, most of these tips are my own. A lot of the tips are right there in line with the inclusive SciComm toolkit. But I wanted to share the inclusive SciComm toolkit with you just so you knew it existed. So this inclusive, inclusive science communication departs from traditional science communication practices by by prioritizing inclusion, equity, and intersectionality as both central parts of the process and as desired outcomes. That's a little vague, but if you go to the toolkit, <laughs> you can learn more about that. It's uh, funded by NSF and developed by the University of Rhode Island Metcalf Institute. All right, so first and foremost, participate, get involved. Um, if you don't want to get involved, if you don't want to participate in science communication, you don't have to, but we want to support and encourage uh, people to do so even if they have no interest in getting involved. And I say that because I don't want to, you know, people often think, oh, I, I have to be D, I have to be giving presentations and being on stages and, write, and, and writing and kind of putting myself out there. And if that's not something you're comfortable with, then you don't have to be doing all of that. But there's lots of other ways that you can get involved and also lots of ways to just support science communication. Um, so we will learn what I want. What I mean by that is I want you to engage with different ways of knowing and learning. So we're going to just take a moment. You're here already, so you're already up for learning, right? Um, science is typically considered through a Western or European centric lens. So therefore, we want to change the way in which we are uh, thinking about science and the way to do that is to learn from folks around you, learn from different groups, right? Engage with different ways of knowing. So we want to integrate bodies of knowledge and expertise from different cultural perspectives and frameworks so you can offer diverse opportunities and approaches to learning. We're going to reflect on our own, our own individual, our own organizations, historical, cultural, and political context, right? As I've said, we bring all of those things with us everywhere we go, our history, our awareness of these contexts. So they may be illuminated by how different people interpret information differently, right? So we want to reflect on our power dynamics. An imbalance of power can result in those with less power being reluctant or unable to share perspectives. I just added a ton of questions here. And the reason I did that, you don't have to read them. You can just look at me while, <laughs> while I talk because I don't want you to think you have to read all of these um, to get the point across. The point across, the point I'm gonna make here is that I'm gonna hand you these questions which come from the Science Museum of Minnesota Ideal Center framework about how we can ask these questions individually or within our groups or within our institutions. Basically how we participate in this uh, system of oppression and system of hierarchy. This is for me to hand over when I give you all the slides. Um, so five is community involvement, meaning we want to involve our community from the very beginning. We want to eliminate authority-based practices and emphasize providing space, safe spaces where, where all individuals are seen, cared for, respected, and valued for their unique perspectives and experiences. We want to be community focused. We want to decenter our work. So we want to broaden capacity to see and understand multiple, multiple perspectives simultaneously. Again, embracing multiple ways of knowing, not just embracing multiple ways of knowing, but understanding that we're not the center of the world, right? Science is not the center of the world, right? This is something that's very hard for people to, to think about um, because they're so ingrained and so embedded. Um, in their world. What skills and knowledge does your community possess? How and what will you learn from the community? Not what do you have to teach them. What, what do you have to learn from them? That should be first and foremost, right? What skills and interests do you have that align with any needs of the community? If there are needs, right? So I'm going to use the Spanish Language Mass Media Fellowship because the Spanish Language Mass Media Fellowship was something that when I spoke 
to the um, Univision and CNN Espanol and these Spanish language news branches, they told me that this is something that they needed because there, there wasn't anybody in the newsroom at that time dedicated to science news. Folks were doing all types of news reporting. So that was something that we had a whole conversation about from the very beginning. We want to utilize existing infrastructure. I'm asking y'all, don't reinvent the wheel. There's going to be programs and opportunities out there, and you can contribute in a way that's very unique, again, to your expertise, to your universities, to your institutions, to your libraries, to your government agencies. Figure out what's there and how you can contribute to those opportunities. And I use the Spanish language, my senior fellowship, once again, because it's an example where I took an existing infrastructure and I added something to it to make it more inclusive. We want to build capacity. That means not treating things as one off, right? Make efforts sustainable. Make if you build sustained capacity, we want to invite people. We want to make sure that they come and that they stay and that they always feel included, not just as a one off. We want to collaborate, of course, just like science and tech and all, te all different sectors, right? Two minds are better than one. We want to reach shared goals, share time and resources. I added this quote from a colleague of mine who told me, I'm an affluent white cis male. My community doesn't need me. It doesn't need to be served. And it seems as though I'm not equipped to participate with any groups anyways, right? Because I just explained how we're best equipped to communicate to our own groups. Well, what I would say is you should collaborate. Collaborate with members of the community in which to serve. Don't go in and serve people that don't want to be served or not even asking them how they need to be served or assuming that, you know, we're in this, I, the white savior space where we need to come in and teach people how to live their lives and think and be and we decide the best way to, the, to do science or to communicate or to learn or to engage with each other. That's not where we want to come from. We want to collaborate. We want to do all those things, right? Be not uh, make decenter ourselves and make sure that we're creating spaces in which people are all, all feeling welcome and, and able to collaborate or contribute. Excuse me. So we want to focus on under-resourced or bicultural groups. Again, I'm an affluent white cis male. I don't, my community doesn't need to be served. So what I would say was I want you to seek out the audience that needs to be served specifically. Figure it out. You know, a lot of people want a, a quick fix. And I would say go in and start working with communities outside of your own. Start working with under-resourced and BIPOC groups. You don't have to, but I would say your efforts are going to be most needed in these spaces because obviously we, we just learned all about how these spaces are ex excluding under-resourced and BIPOC groups. Uh, this is one of my favorite ones. This one comes from the inclusive inclusive SciComm toolkit. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Again, there's no quick fix. This work requires time. You may not be able to uh, apply every single practice that I've just shared all at once, and that's fine. Take the pieces that you think are relevant. Take the pieces that you want to work on first, right? Over time, as you develop your skills and competencies and relationships and confidence in this area, um, you'll be able to experiment with different strategies and techniques. This is a lifelong process. I'm learning every day about how to communicate with different groups. I'm learning every day about how to be m more inclusive and learning every day about how to not contribute to systems of oppression. Right? This is something I think about daily, and it should be. It should be something you think about daily as well. And embrace the discomfort. Dialogue feels awkward. Maybe some of the things I shared with you today feel awkward. Embrace the discomfort, right? Discomfort is part of the process. Hold yourself accountable. When you inevitably say or do something with which another person takes issue, acknowledge that you've made how, how you've made that person feel. Acknowledge it. Sit in it. Make it uncomfortable. It's okay to be uncomfortable, right? Making mistakes is the key to learning and connecting across differences. So those are my 12 tips for you all. I always end with science is evolving and what it means to be a scientist, what it means to be a science communicator, what it means to be all of y'all are here right now. That's evolving too, where we learn as we go. And I want to hear from everybody what you have to say. So I'll stop sharing. I told you, Tiffany, I was going to be good this time and not... <laughs> 
up and not go to 1130. <laughs> You're welcome. So we have plenty of time for questions, folks. Mm -hmm. If you have any, now is your chance. Thanks, Sally. Thanks, Shay. This is good, too, because uh, this also allows folks, I know some optimized people only have an hour to participate. Yeah. Um, another thing I want to say about sharing my slides is um, feel free to use any of the slides and information in, in your institutions or in your organizations. I attribute everything that I've taken from other groups or other slides or other presentations. And so um, I hope you attribute the same folks that I do. Uh, but feel free to use anything that you've seen here today. You don't even need to attribute it to me. because. <laughs> Because this is something I want. I want to make sure everybody has this information. It looks like we have a question. Um, it says, I was curious about the authority-based practice you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, what they are and how specifically they might be happening and avoid it in academia. So this is uh, theory and teaching uh, from Bell Hooks. Uh, Transcend, uh, somebody might know um, the book I'm referencing and have it handy in their minds. Teaching to Transcend is the book. Um, and this is, oh, I think that's what it's called, from Bell Hooks. And this is a fabulous um, book specifically on that topic. So I am going to share that reference and ask you to read it. It's all about uh, authority-based teaching practices and that, and so I'll give you some examples uh, like a weed out class. Like why somebody, do we? Somebody yeah. was asking for the toolkit link. Is it out of Rhode teaching Island? Teaching to Transgress, not transcend. I was like, I know I have it wrong. Transgress, thank you. <laughs> um, I can give you the link to someone else can, if you just, uh, if somebody wants to Google Metcalf Institute SciComm Toolkit, inclusive SciComm Toolkit. Um, great. Yep, starter kit, sorry, not toolkit. I looked it up as soon as you said it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's very good. Um, and this came out, you know, after I'd already done this presentation 100 times. So it was really nice to see a lot of the ideas that I had reflected in that starter kit as well. And again, able to integrate a few of those ideas. Um, it, we have another question from Jackson. Thank you. This is a great presentation. From presentations you've given, do you have any other examples of collaborations on college campuses that brought lots of people together? Hmm, that's a really hard question. Collaborations on campuses that brought lots of people together. You know, campuses are still working really hard to do this. And maybe folks in the, I'm having a hard time answering that question. <laughs> I, need, like, I need to reflect a minute. Um, one thing I will say is that this has become such a huge priority for the National Science Foundation um, that, and we'll see the outcomes of that, but if any of you all are, or are familiar with the Advancing Informal STEM Learning um, proposal, uh, call for proposal, it's totally changed this year to incorporate a lot of the ideas 
around community partnerships that I mentioned here about bringing people together and about creating projects and programs that are incorporating uh, different ways of knowledge and also community involvement in the planning and the dissemination and the execution of projects from the very beginning. Um, so while I, I'm having a hard time thinking, maybe I think I know that that's going to get better because we are investing our federal dollars to do this. And typically when NFS, NSF mandates change, it trickles down um, into other agencies and, of course, all the universities um, because they're, you know, applying for these grants. So, and I say that with, with a caveat that I want, I reread your question, um, Jackson, to just point out that it's okay if programs and groups and projects don't reach a lot of people. Um, I host a lecture for the public. Um, I host four lectures a month. One of them is on the weekend and it's on campus. Um, so it's exclusive in the fact that uh, it's a weekend morning. So you have to have your weekend mornings free and also it's on campus. So these are people who have the means and ability and even interest to going to the UC Berkeley campus. And that's a predominantly older white crowd. But the rest of my rest of my lectures, this is like our flagship program, are reaching uh, folks who are in community. So I, for example, one of the things I do is I go into, I partner with the Fruitvale Library, which is, Fruitvale is a predominantly Latino neighborhood in Oakland, and I place Spanish-speaking scientists in those um, libraries to do sort, you know, ha hands-on and very, very kind of uh, conversation uh, driven science talks for the Spanish speaking public. So they're all Spanish speaking. They're all there talking with the public. And my, the we reason I say a lot of people isn't so much the point is because if I reach 200 older white people, that's one thing. And if I reach 20 Latino Hispanic families, 20 individuals within a family, not 20 families, 20 individuals within a family, I feel more impactful when those 20 individuals show up to reach a Latino scientist than I do on those Saturday lectures. And that's because that may or may not be the first time those folks have interacted with a scientist. It may be the first time that those folks have ever even uh, but it's not that it's a science museum, but it's a science of it's a science program. It's a science event. That may be the first time that the family has ever had that experience as a family to be able to do that, to be able to engage and think about science. And again, that to me is a million times. I, I have warm and fuzzies after those events. I don't really have warm and I have warm and fuzzies because my lectures are done. Right? <laughs> it's like okay, I've done that, been there, but I get genuinely excited for those 20 individuals. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to the authority base because I didn't fully answer the questions about examples of that. And I had just briefly mentioned um, uh, weeder classes. And that's a good, that's a good example. It's like we decide who is invited or not invited into science. Um, based on how well they do in a class and that that and the class the whole point of the class is to exclude people right a weeder class the point of a weeder class is to exclude people right it's a horrible thing that we do within the university system and we're purposely doing it we're almost proud that we do that there was, an, there was another, um, I want to say it was this American Life episode about 
the exclusion of the SAT after COVID um, and how it affected the, the university system. And it was so good. Like it was, I, because I am a brown woman who struggled in the first two years of undergraduate, it literally made me cry because things got easier after you got through the weeder classes. But why? Like, why are we making it so hard for people to be scientists? It's just mind boggling to me. So anyways, that's a, a very distinct uh, example. Um, okay, another question. Nope, oh, that looks like it's it so far. Well, the uh, non-biased information is accessible to people in the library system. Mm. It seems as though everything is biased. Include uh, voices in your collections from non-power right groups. So folks who are part of the community, you know, Black, Indigenous, people of color, just just provide different sources of knowledge. Um, I would say that's step one. Because if it's biased, I don't know if we need to like rip everything from the shelves, but we need to acknowledge the biases. And we need to include different ways of knowledge or different ways of knowing. Um, so that would be my suggestion. It, it, it's easy to think I am part of a system and I can't make a difference. It's easy to get overwhelmed. And it is something that I preach that each one of us individually can make a difference, even if it feels very small. Maybe it means adding a sidebar onto the website, which includes people of color. Maybe it means when you're talking about a subject, making a deliberate deciding, I'm going to remove all the white men that are featured in my talk and only feature women and only feature people of color, right? Being very deliberate about it. You don't need to say it, but people will notice, right? And it'll make a huge difference in the way that we, that people, again, feel excluded, feel included or part of a community. I wonder if this is a good opportunity to invest more in smaller size qualitative research into science to actually get other kinds of knowledge because of the bias. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I do at UC Berkeley and a bunch of organizations are, or institutions are doing a lot more to think about the the broader impacts and societal impacts and um, research impacts and outreach and education mandates by funding agencies, um, whether that be from a foundation or the NSF, right, and everything in between, or a local government, right? There's this idea that, and it's, you know, California just released millions of dollars to support climate um, research projects. And one of the biggest, th I mean, they said it over and over and over and over and over again, is community partnerships, doing the social justice work. We want to see the social justice lens. Not we want, you have to tell us about the social justice lens. You have to include partners from communities that have been marginalized. It, it's a mandate, okay, to even get this money. So what universities are thinking more about and, and other institutions are how to train scientists to understand those mandates and to participate in those mandates as not a one-off or a thing that I have to do, but actually as part of my role as a scientist. Um, and institutionalizing the support to make that happen. So not just say, okay, here's this mandate, figure it out. But what are the structures and what are the 
you know, resources that a university has to ensure that that work is happening and not as a side bar, not as a side thought but it's happening at the forefront of a project, a research, a scientific research project, at the very, very forefront of that research project. What are the ways in which I'm impacting society? And how can I be as impactful as I can? How can I measure my impact, right? We all, like, I shouldn't say we all know, we might not all know, um, that there's not just the mandate to have the impact, it's the mandate to measure the impact. And so, there's no reason why this impact has to be huge or right it can be it can be five people i can measure the impact of what how my you know what my plan is to um, impact society in a way that's just based off five people's experiences and that's totally fine um, again it's probably more meaningful to have a smaller group of people that you're working with yeah, so I think that you're right. This is a really good opportunity to invest. And and when, when I say invest, I don't know if you men invest, but invest money, right? <laughs> Investment in actual resources. Um, and the mandate makes it clear that we can also invest our budgets to do this work. So when you're applying for, you know, grants through all of these different uh, agencies or through foundations, you can, you should be investing that money into these, into programs, which do the work of the societal impact and the broader impact piece. Mm. A lot of the biographies that we have. Huh. Yeah, that's a problem for sure. We got a few more minutes, folks. If you're sitting there stewing on a question. Is there a way to, well, one, of course, including biographies written by people of color, but also I wonder if there's a way to sort of call out that questionable nature of language um, in a way that's not like maybe it's a header that says we recognize that, you know, our, even our resources are about people of color or not written by people of color or something, right? There's a way to call that out. Um, you should brainstorm with your library community about what that might mean and what that might look like. I don't know if I know enough about that space to contribute any more um but i can help you think about it if you want but yeah that's hard one of the things that i want to bring up because it hasn't been asked yet and this is a question that i get from a lot of stem institutions um about some of these efforts. And so if you are or not from STEM institutions, uh, I think it's useful information or advice. Um, one of the things that folks will ask or say is that young and also people of color and also women, as we saw with the statistics around thinking about whether or not room, newsrooms are diverse enough, um, tend to be the folks who show up. Like maybe if we did a study on the demographics here, um, it would skew towards women or uh, young and people of color. And so when you host a workshop or a talk or a lecture, you tend to be inviting Right. You, you invite everyone, but only certain people show up. And one of the things that I always suggest of departments or universities is that when they have these talks and even scientific conferences, so if I go to a, I'm part of the American Geophysical Union Conference, there's an entire 
uh, right? Ses there's a full sessions on inclusion and equity and um, teaching pra equitable teaching practices that exist at the same time as the scientific conferences, meaning that people are don't have a choice to attend both. They uh, choose the science the science uh, sessions, and so and when I go into a department, typically it's like a special lecture. What I want from departments and universities is to start integrating these sessions within their normal day. So if we have six sessions on a scientific topic, then maybe one of those sessions is on, right, equity and science. Oh, in the middle, so that people have to sit through it. <laughs> because if they're given the choice, they're, they may not show up. Um, and I see that time and time again because I'm invited to go to even pre-COVID when I'd be invited to go to uh, to um, departments and give this talk at the exact same time as all the rest of the science talks, right? The colloquium for the department. Uh, the people who hosted me were like, damn, the people who I wanted to be in the room aren't in the room. And I would be like, they don't come. They're not showing up. And that's a way to do that is to create a space where where people are already there and they have nowhere to go and they have to listen to this. Um, I think that that's fine. Force feed it to folks who need to be there. So anyways, that's often a, a question I get is like, how do I convince my department or the people within my, my department that this is important and that they should be hearing these things that you're saying? Um, and that's one way to do it, as opposed to, again, creating a special separate session where people can choose or choose not to go. We have a question um, from Carly. Yeah, that's asking, a good one. Do you have uh, new sources you trust, recommend to broaden cultural and community perspectives as a starting point? You know what I would do is I would, uh, in instead of thinking about news sources, I would think about writers, like news writers. So thinking about maybe you know, who are your favorite diverse reporters, um, reporters of color, and follow them in their work because they either maybe not at one specific news outlet, um, most likely they're freelance and they write for a ton of different news outlets. Um, and so that's what I would suggest is follow reporters of color. Go on Twitter right now. I guarantee there is a thread about science news or just news coverage from minority writers and minority communicators. And you follow every single one of them and create a group in Twitter. And so that when they post their content, you get it and you get to read it. I would say follow writers of color specifically. Yeah, and there's a lot of really brilliant writers of color out there. Mm -hmm. But thanks for that. That's a really great question. I thought so, too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, awesome. I'll have to read that, too. Thanks, Jenny. I'm going to write that down. <laughs> And thanks to everyone who's right. I'm just realizing that people are also writing to me specifically. So I want to thank you for that. Who are saying thank you. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the Network of the National Library of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel, or select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.